Thank you, JJ. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. And um, I'm going to talk about, uh, if not answer, that question that JJ posed, is there such a thing as American cuisine? And um, uh, yeah, so you've seen from the poster already the, uh, the book, this one, uh, on which my talk is kind of based, uh, how it got this way. Um, you know, when you are going to go to a Chinese restaurant or an Italian restaurant, you have an idea of what's going to be on the menu, right? Uh, but American restaurant could be anything. Um, it could be seasonal farm to table. It could be a burger place. Uh, it could have a kind of mixed set of options like, uh, I mean, Applebee's has fajitas and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of what the agenda is. This, I'm, I'm going to say that there are three characteristics of American cuisine. Rather than like Italian cuisine, you know, a restaurant's going to have pasta. Uh, yes, burgers, pizza, as um, JJ mentioned, but uh, if you look at what Americans eat, it doesn't really form a cuisine. There are things like donuts, um, uh, uh, pizza, breakfast cereal. A, a cuisine are things that are a little more complicated. So there are a lot of things that people think of as American, but that people don't really make anymore, not to the extent that they did when, when I was a child, for example. So like something like pot roast might be thought of as American or even apple pie supposedly that's um, as American as you can get. But uh, where I live at least, uh, you'd find it tricky, not impossible, not even very difficult, but tricky to find apple pie. Uh, it would be easier to find uh, uh, tacos or um, uh, avocado toast. Now that's partly because I live in the Northeast and in uh, the New York suburbs and teach in New Haven, Connecticut. But even so, uh, I think this is a general thing and that not many people make these supposedly typically American dishes. So my, my argument's gonna be that there are kind of three basic aspects to American food rather than dishes. One is regionalism. So the food of particular regions. The second is what I just refer to as modernity the industrial food or the standardized food that most of us know from supermarkets. And that if you're in a supermarket in Seattle, they'll have the same Nabisco cookies and Tropicana orange juice as a supermarket in Miami. Where you get differences is not in geography, but in class. So you'd immediately know if you were in a Whole Foods or in a supermarket that has a less affluent clientele, but you wouldn't necessarily know if you were in uh, the Midwest or the, uh, the South. You know, a few products might be different, but not, uh, not really. The average supermarket has 40,000 items and, and they're, they're pretty standardized. So that's the second aspect is industrial food, processed food, standardization, a lot of canned, frozen, um, uh, packaged uh, food. And then the third is variety. A variety is a little um, uh, non-obvious because I just got through saying that the food is standardized and it's the same everywhere. But that 40,000 items is part of variety. Or the fact, to me, exasperating that, you know, Tropicana orange juice, you like you've got to hunt for the original kind. It's in so many different They've got, you know, calcium, grove stand, no pulp, extra pulp. Uh, many of these things come in so many different kinds that often the store will be out of original. Always a struggle in my supermarket to get cottage cheese because, you know, they, they've got pineapple cottage cheese. They've got low fat uh, pot cheese. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but variety is something that Americans love. And that's part of the reason why it's hard to say what American food is, because again, thinking of that Applebee's menu, uh, they'll have 
food from sort of all over the world or the food uh, uh, at restaurants. There are, there are more Chinese restaurants in the United States, more Mexican restaurants in the United States than restaurants that say that they're American. Uh, and um, this is something that goes back a, a long time ago. So Americans have always been interested uh, in the food of other people and, uh, and other countries. So, um, uh, you know, this is a familiar image to uh, uh, many of you, a mechanical harvester, uh, old fashioned one, obviously, but this is the basis of that second industrial food aspect that I mentioned. The um, 19th century saw the development of these things. So the museum, the Monroe County Museum is focused on the early 19th century. And this is crucial because uh, 1819, uh, the you know, early settlement of uh, the southeastern part of Michigan is before the introduction of most of the things that made the industrial food, processed food, big corporation food system possible. If you go back to the earliest days of settlement in the future United States, a historian named James McWilliams has described the labor involved in just preparing an ordinary dinner on a hypothetical affluent farm in Maryland. Uh, affluent mean, you know, prosperous, good soil, uh, and of course the soil was very good indeed because it had not been worked for generations. Uh, if you imagine a meal of say uh, cornbread, pickled beef, um, uh, butter, uh, and um, yeah, uh, apple cider, the amount of labor that this required from this family, the corn kernels, you know, of course, have to be grown, but you, let's say you have your corn kernels harvested, they had to be soaked and ground to grind cornmeal without, you know, electricity or uh, uh, powerful machines requires at least an hour of grinding with some kind of mortar and pestle arrangement. The pickled beef, they, they like, they'd have it all. And the reason for pickling it is, of course, uh, for it to keep a long time. But along with, um, say, smoked pork, the, probably these were the two big meats of this farm. But this involved rearing these animals, slaughtering, butchering, uh, and preserving their meat. So there's a lot of labor behind that relatively convenient. The hardest item is the butter in terms of just hours of labor. The dairy would have been run in such a farm by a skilled uh, young woman, a milkmaid, a dairy maid who was hired. And everything um, had to be scrupulously clean because of the um, ease of milk souring and also the threat of uh, extremely serious diseases. Uh, the maid could milk a cow, what, uh, 10 minutes or so? And in order to make it worthwhile to make butter, uh, maybe seven cows would have to be milked. The cream would be skimmed off. And of course, it depends on the weather, how quickly the churning would go. Uh, on a dry, warm, but not hot summer day, maybe two hours. If the weather was cold, and, and today, I don't know what it's like, but today where I live is uh, unseasonably cold and wet. The cornmeal would be cooked with the milk and made into a porridge, or it could be made into bread, pancakes. Um, if we're assuming cornbread, it would be served with the butter. And so one of the things about corn, besides it's being nourishing, is its versatility. So maybe they'd have carrots and beans uh, the apple cider requires the apples to be crushed, again, necessitating considerable labor. In Monroe County, in its early days, or in the early 19th century, there would have been more trade than in 17th century Maryland, for sure. Larger settlements, 
um, millers, uh, you know, commercial mills that would grind the grain, but the kind of self-sufficiency uh, that I've described would still be the rule. Before the advent of modern agriculture, of processing, of transportation technology, uh, food depended on climate, location, and seasons. Uh, of course, you're near to one of the sites to Detroit uh, and, and other cities in Michigan, the heartland of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th and early 20th century. But uh, what are these aspects of the Industrial Revolution that most affect food? Uh, railroads in terms of the transport uh, across large and often, uh, you know, uh, um, difficult uh, uh, terrain, uh, large distances. Uh, the refrigeration technology for refrigerated railroad cards developed in the 1880s, of course, dramatically increases the ability of perishable products uh, uh, to travel for a long time, uh, more or less intact. This is what made the California fruit and vegetable industry, agricultural machinery, um, hydroelectric power. This is a postcard of the Norris Dam from the Tennessee Valley Authority, one of the great examples of government um, intervention and development uh, that uh, brought rural electrification. So the Rural Electrification Administration uh, in the 1930s increased the percentage of people in the United States who had electricity from something like 50 to nearly universal. And, the, and this is a little bit like the current broadband campaign where rural areas, it wasn't worthwhile for um, the large private companies to build the infrastructure for them. And the, this, is, this is dramatic in terms of the electrification of farms, the standard of living, but also obviously the ability to industrialize things like uh, uh, dairies or uh, you know, other aspects of farming. And then all the food processing technology. Canning is among the oldest, uh, dehydrating, Frozen foods really don't get started until just after the Second World War. But you know, obviously, our whole life is built on these technologies. And this has meant, uh, I probably don't have to tell you, a radical reduction of the percentage of people in the United States involved in agriculture. This is just up to 2013. At the time of our hypothetical farm, or really uh, at the time of the uh, Monroe County Museum's orientation, 75 to 80%. That's not because they liked farming, but that's because that's what it took to feed people. The 15 or 25 to 25% of the people who weren't engaged in farming, uh, you know, were uh, doing other things, but they were dependent on a agrarian society. And this starts to reduce radically in the second half of the 19th century and then throughout the 20th century so that a tiny percentage of the population is engaged in agriculture. Similarly, although agriculture remains uh, absolutely vital in the sense of feeding people other activities that people could go into because a huge percentage of the population was not engaged in agriculture. And, you know, and I have no investment in saying that this is a good thing. Uh, a, a lot of these activities are foolish or frivolous or involve people making insane amounts of money on, you know, on cryptocurrency or on uh, social media. And nevertheless, you can see that the uh, part of the GNP that agriculture represents is much smaller. And what this means in terms of the life of people who are not involved in agriculture or in allied industries involving processing or machinery or transport is that the price of food in terms of how much a household spends is relatively small. 
So if you look at the period covered by the museum, uh, 1819 or 1850 or so, you'd get uh, a figure of at least 60 to 80% of a household income had to be spent on food, what it is in so-called undeveloped countries now. Uh, today in the United States, the percentage is um, maybe uh, 16. So 16% of the average household's income, and even with the inflation of the past year, uh, maybe that's bumped up to 17 or 18. But this is um, not an insignificant amount, but it certainly means that people have a lot of money to spend on other things. So all of this is to say, uh, it's a good idea to acknowledge the real advances in speed and comfort and basic technological innovations, indoor plumbing, refrigeration, gas and electricity. And these have not only increased productivity, which is really what this chart is about, but they've reduced the drudgery and time involved in having to prepare meals. The United States for much of its history has had a tremendous amount of abundance and variety. And um, this was a source of pride for the nation. So here is a uh, photograph from the US Information Agency. Uh, and it was exhibited uh, at um, uh, American exhibits at fairs like uh, the Zagreb then Yugoslavia fair in 1958, uh, or the famous <clears throat> Moscow fair of 1959 at which Richard Nixon had his famous debate with Soviet Premier Khrushchev. But uh, if you look at this woman, and this is, again, this is, this is real, uh, even though many uh, uh, foreign countries, particularly of the <clears throat> Soviet bloc, uh, uh, denounce this as lies. You know, this is not a working class person. This is not an ordinary person. This is a rich person. But in fact, as uh, many of you will remember, this is 1958, and, and, and this is a, a, a week shopping. But notice that the way the photograph uh, is, it highlights packaged foods, and, you know, uh, packaged bread, crackers, meat in, um, uh, you know, bacon and stuff like that in uh, industrially processed forms. So this is a boast. This is um, not propaganda in the sense of being untrue, but it's propaganda in the sense of being true, that Americans have a very high standard of living on average. That is that ordinary people have a high standard of living. And this was part of the Cold War. And this was the Nixon Khrushchev debate in Moscow, where uh, a model kitchen was shown. And Khrushchev on the one hand said, uh, this, is, this is not an ordinary person's kitchen. And then he sort of said, manifestly untrue, but nevertheless, uh, well, our, our Soviet workers have kitchens just like this. So this was, you know, this was a point of uh, inflection and of advantage for the United States. So now to come back to the question, um, is there such a thing as American cuisine, just apart from having a lot of options and this abundance I was just talking about? Observers from other countries would definitely have an opinion about this. Observers from other countries would tell you one of three things, or maybe a combination. One, uh, there is no such thing as American cuisine, or that everything is borrowed from somewhere else. You know, okay, fajitas, uh, yeah, but that's from Mexico. Or pizza, yeah, but that's from Italy. Another is that American cuisine is basically fast food. Uh, and that certainly has been our most notable food export. And a third and somewhat more favorable is that American cuisine is eclectic, varied, that Americans like to eat, you know, one kind of food one day and another, uh, another, which is a way of sort of going back to the first, there's no stable American dish. The way, for example, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm also a historian of the Middle Ages. That's kind of like my day job. And I, I was in Bologna, Italy a few years ago to give a talk on a medieval topic. And my host and her husband took me to a restaurant in the city, which is in Italy itself famous for the quality of its food. And our first course were tortellini. And they were the best tortellini I've ever had in my life. And hands down, 
and uh, they were meat tortellini. And, and the husband of my house said, oh, um, you know, in other parts, other towns in Italy, they make tortellini with spinach or cheese. And I said, well, this is a very American quest uh, question, but it didn't occur to me. Oh, do you ever just get tired of meat tortellini and have spinach or cheese tortellini? And he looked at me like I'd suggested putting, you know, pineapple on pizza, which is more plausible in America than what I was suggesting. He said, no, no, we're in Bologna. In Bologna, we eat meat tortellini. Well, if you come back to my supermarket, they've got, I counted, they've got eight kinds of tortellini. Um, you know, sun-dried tomato tortellini, portobello mushroom tortellini, and so forth. The quality is not as good, but there's more variety. And that's certainly one aspect of American cuisine, certainly in the eyes of foreigners. The rest of the world has kind of changed. Here's a sign from a town in France showing you know, the direction to uh, a, a, a restaurant uh, called Tacos and Company. And they're joking around, right? Authentic French. So this is for tourists in the town of Poitiers. Authentic French food is now tacos, burgers, panini. This is new in much of the world. I mean, you know, Tex-Mex restaurants in Copenhagen, sushi in Barcelona. Uh, until recently, the food you get in France was French food. And uh, now it's kind of, there's a global eclectic cuisine. Notice that these, this isn't an Americanization in the sense that people thought it would be 30 years ago or so, where they thought, you know, McDonald's would take over everywhere. McDonald's certainly is uh, all over the place, but tacos aren't an American export, although they were developed in Mexico. Panini, an American export, although developed in Italy. Sushi, an American export, although developed in Japan. So uh, the United States is kind of like the retailer of mixing things up. Uh, and uh, a, a huge number of countries, uh, for better or worse, have adopted that. I mentioned regionalism. So regionalism, the, the most intact cuisines are um, probably in the South, the Southwest, and especially Louisiana. And so probably no, Louisiana has two, Southern Louisiana has two cuisines, the sophisticated uh, cuisine of New Orleans, referred to as Creole, and the um, more hearty, rural, and spicier cuisine of the Cajun country outside uh, and particularly to the west of New Orleans. And so this is an American cuisine, um, but uh, th there was a much richer variety of regional products. So in the 19th century, the two most elegant dishes that you know had to be served at the finest dinner parties in Philadelphia or New York or Boston or San Francisco uh, were terrapin, so this di diamondback turtles. They're about um, maybe two foot long. No, not two, but one foot long. So this picture makes them look huge, but they're actually uh, a, a rather small animals. Very difficult to take apart. Uh, I've had it once in Delaware and it's absolutely delicious. Uh, and canvasback ducks. So these uh, rather large ducks, uh, these were the two great luxury dishes. Now, neither of them are, you know, basically findable today, partly because of the depletion of species. The best ones came from the Chesapeake Bay and um, they, uh, uh, you can see how much American taste has changed by the fact that these are, these are so unfamiliar to us. So these are, and the terrapin is remembered as the mascot of the University of Maryland, but uh, you know, why did they choose terrapin is something most people, most people don't, uh, don't know. So as I said, mid-Atlantic food, Chesapeake Bay cuisine, I mean, there are a few items like soft shell crabs are, are, are big, but um, partly environmental conditions and their degradation partly changes in taste, partly expense, mean that many American regional foods 
are either extinct or not really flourishing, or they're not really regional. So for example, key lime pie, uh, people think that this is from the Florida Keys and it's somehow an age old dish. But in fact, um, it's first attested to in women's magazines from the post-war era. And it was a variation on a uh, Borden's condensed milk recipe uh, for something called magic lemon cream pie. And it just substituted the limes and it just made up uh, uh, the, uh, the key lime uh, affiliation. Uh, again, the, the mixing things up is what our country tends to be about. This is a menu from about 1961. It says, New Orleans house. So it's supposed to have Creole food, at least by its name. It's in Louisville, Kentucky, as you can see on the bottom left. And they're advertising a clam bake, which is a New England uh, uh, dish. And if you open the menu up, this clam bake has gumbo. And there's nowhere on the northeastern Atlantic coast where they would have served gumbo at a clam bake. Well, you know, I laugh, but so what? Um, if people enjoy it, why not, why not serve it? And that is very different from this. Um, this is how we do tortellini. And we don't vary it because we're bored. Uh, we don't get bored with it. I can think of some things that are like that in the United States where purity and doing it right is very important. I spent a fair amount of time before I taught at Yale in the South and their barbecue, is that, that to do barbecue in North Carolina is to do it a certain way. And you, you don't vary that, There's similarly with Texas. Or pizza where I now live, New Haven has, um, I, I think it's fair to say the best pizza in the United States, but it's a certain type and uh, there's no market for New York style pizza, even though New York is only 70 miles away. But notice that these are two foods that people don't prepare at home. They're, they're foods that, you know, have to be, I mean, you've got to be a real fanatic to do your own uh, uh, slow barbecuing or uh, have a pizza oven in order to do it uh, the way these professional places do. So um, regional food has been largely replaced by industrial food. And, and by industrial food, I mean not only uh, the processing of food, but various claims that many of us will remember from our childhood. The Wonder Bread helps build strong bodies 12 ways. Uh, the fact is that processed bread has taken out most of the nutrients from uh, a natural bread, uh, but the company just sort of stuffed them back in. And it turns out that you don't actually get the benefit. Your body can't absorb these vitamins and minerals as well when they're retrofitted as when they're in the original product. The whole breakfast cereal industry was developed on the notion of simplicity and convenience. You know, you don't have to heat up the stove, make eggs, bacon, or hot cereal. All you do is uh, the cereal in a bowl, you've got her. And originally it was a health food. Uh, it was developed by people like the Kellogg's who were Seventh-day Adventists and who had a kind of a health resort in, in Battle Creek, of course. So the idea was that um, cornflakes are more convenient for you uh, and they're better for you. This, of course, was trespassed on a little by things like adding sugar. So in my childhood, uh, two famous uh, or popular cereals were Frosted Flakes and Sugar Pops. And they still exist, but they've taken uh, sugar Frosted Flakes. They've taken the word sugar out. So they're now just Frosted Flakes. And Sugar Pops are now called, I think, just um, uh, Corn Pops. But uh, the, the advertisement I remember from TV with Sugar Pops, Pete had the line, uh, they're shot with sugar through and through. You know, this was like a, a, a benefit. So 
Convenience, modernity, healthfulness, actual taste tended not to be so important. So Tang, uh, another product from my childhood. Uh, Tang was marketed as, first of all, the Gemini astronauts. To me, this even at the time didn't make any sense because um, these guys are in this claustrophobic little compartment. So of course they don't have like <laughs> room to squeeze oranges, but like I'm not in such confined circumstances. Nevertheless, that advertisement is just like the Gemini astronauts so you can be modern scientific, but also it's good for you. This is a typical product because the convenience is somewhat false. It doesn't take very much more energy to make orange juice from concentrate or a little later to open a wax container or even to squeeze your own oranges than to uh, mix up the tang. And, and that's why tang is not what it was in 1963 or four when, uh, uh, when this advertisement was developed. As I said before, convenience and modernity, I mean, hallmarks of the industrial food uh, uh, revolution. Oh, this is my cat, sorry. Uh, the hallmarks of this industrialization of food uh, were accompanied by variety. Uh, so rice -roni. when I was a kid, rice -roni came in four fabulous flavors, as the TV commercial said. Uh, and and it, it now there are like 25 flavors or so. Here are just, just 12 of them. So once again, they're not saying that rice roni is all that marvelous tasting, but it comes in so many different varieties that you ought to find, um, uh, you know, some, one that suits you. So I want to spend uh, a, a other innovations like Jello. Uh, these innovations produce food that nobody's ever really seen before. So this is the reverse of the apple pie or even the tortellini idea that, oh, here is a product that my grandmother taught me. The whole idea of this little cookbook put out by Knox Gelatin in the late 50s or early 60s is um, you, don't, you don't really have to um, adhere to tradition. You can make your own things uh, and it's a way of selling more more gelatin, obviously. Another form of variety um, is foreign food, or you know, ethnic food, as it's sometimes called. This restaurant called the Pekin Noodle House is in Butte, Montana, and it has the distinction of being the oldest still operating Chinese restaurant in the United States. It's from um, 1911. And notice that their signature dish, now very out of fashion, was uh, chop suey. I looked on the web and found uh, five Chinese restaurants in Monroe County, but I'm sure uh, there are more of them. Those are probably just the ones that have a kind of a, a, a takeout menu. Uh, but there are more Chinese restaurants in the United States than there are uh, McDonald's and Burger King combined. So once again, Americans are very big on uh, what is considered to be exotic food, whether it's really exotic or not. This is a painting by the famous American artist, Edward Hopper. These two women are eating in what's obviously a Chinese restaurant because you can see the, the suey sign outside. The full sign must have been um, chop suey. So these two women bring me to the final little section of my talk. Uh, and I wanted to devote it to men, women, and food, to the ways in which men and women have developed different tastes in food, or at least uh, are perceived as having different tastes in food. Some of this goes back to changes in women's um, ideal image. <coughs> this is uh, Lillian Russell, uh, uh, the actress, the American beauty. And as you see in the, if you can read the print below, her look was called airy fairy because she was thought to be so delicate. Whereas by modern standards, you know, she's pretty hefty. This is not the current female silhouette ideal. The radical slimming of the ideal female look began 
with the Gibson girl in the 1890s. And by the time of the flapper of the 1920s, uh, the look was uh, arguably unrealistically slim. And this encouraged a tremendous focus on diet and health, a radical simplification of food and a orientation of men towards hearty, old fashioned food and of women towards light food. The role of women in the um, advertiser's point of view was as providers for their husband and children, but also as providers, not only of necessities, but of delight. So in this cookbook put out by a flower company, uh, he's not only just, you know, sitting at the table and she's serving him, he's happy, he's delighted. And so the linking of uh, nutrition, nurturing the wife as a uh, homemaker is uh, given a spin that is also she's the provider of pleasure. And it's not a sexual pleasure, but it's sort of not, not a sexual pleasure either. And sometimes this is put in, um, you know, very frank terms. This is one of the most popular cookbooks of the 20th century, known as the Settlement Cookbook, whose motto actually, or real title was the way to a man's heart. Right? The full proverb was the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So the notion is your husband is going to be uh, happy and um, contented if you cook well. The advertisers, the cookbook industry, a lot of this stuff directed to women assume that men are, are, are infantile. So he, you know, look, he's feeding him green giant canned peas. Green, he'll, he loves them. And, you know, um, the love and touch for any meal. This is the advertiser's paradigm is our food is insanely convenient. I mean, what is more convenient than canned peas? And he'll love it. Whereas this is, um, he'll love it, but uh, since this is a flower company, they're not telling you to break open some little uh, uh, instant uh, muffin mix. You, you actually have to make the muffins. You've got to have the yeast or the baking powder, whatever it is that um, is going to rise uh, the dough. So these are two, uh, images uh, from, um, crucially, from different times. The muffin cookbook from before the war, uh, the Green Giant ad from after the war. This guy, I mean, this is what I mean by the infantilizing. This is an advertisement for cornflakes. And he's having a tantrum because mother never ran out of Kellogg's cornflakes. Advertising is not supposed to be taken seriously exactly but it's supposed to be memorable and it's gotta be memorable on something that is at least 70% um, plausible, I would say. I mean, I'm not in the advertising business, but 70% 70, 70 like you probably wouldn't see a scene like this in real life quite, uh, but um, uh, what do I know actually? I do most of the cooking uh, in my family. Uh, so uh, already I'm a little atypical. Um, just flat out use of uh, sex to sell things. I mean, again, the advertising company who developed this and the rice industry, the rice council who paid for it, don't literally believe that this is true, right? They don't literally believe that rice is the equivalent of a uh, gorgeous, at least for the time of this advertisement, uh, sexual or potential sexual partner. Uh, it's funny. But on the other hand, this is, um, they're actually selling a product. They're not making a joke. Why husbands leave home. This is an advertisement for uh, convenient frozen meals. So it's frozen uh, by a, a, a chain of restaurants that was big in the Northeast called Schrath's from about 1900 to 1980. This advertisement is from the 60s. And 
this is completely crazy. This, this guy is leaving home because his wife doesn't cook well for him. But the advertiser is not saying, make your own muffins from scratch or make your own apple pie from scratch. The ab advertiser is saying, um, we have a convenience product, but your husband, your husband will, uh, will not stray away. Here is a brochure that my mother had uh, for an oven, uh, the Grand Oven Company. So you can't see the top of the title, I think, but it's cooking in the grand manner. Uh -huh. Notice this scene. The husband, just like the muffin guy, is delighted. He you know, is bending over to sniff the aroma of that standing rib roast. There's some muffins actually over on the right side top and something, you know, a vegetable in the little pot. And uh, so they're gonna have a wonderful meal, but then they're gonna go out because look at how she's dressed. She's, um, she's wearing an apron, but she's got a low cut gown. Uh, she's got some pearls, she's got her hair up. The message of this is you can satisfy your husband, but you know, this woman, I mean, she's domestic looking and she's you know, certainly pretty, but um, she's been slaving away all day. And she doesn't look like she's about to go out dancing or to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, even a movie. Whereas this couple have it both ways. And that idea of having it both ways is kind of the story of American food. And uh, American food, as I said, is kind of innovative, even if not in the way we want. This advertisement for Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, cream of mushroom soup was like the convenience product of the post-war era. You could make all sorts of sauces, casseroles, and so forth out of it. This is an advertisement for, first of all, something that no one has ever actually seen. There's no, there's no region that specializes in tuna crunch casserole. The crunch it could be three options, if I recall correctly. One are goldfish crackers, potato chips, and uh, canned onion rings. And there are 11 ingredients, my God, you know, you'd have to cook all day to make this. Uh, but six of them conveniently are here in Campbell's Cream and Mushroom Soup. So it's convenient, hearty, delicious, cheap. You know, wh what, what more could you possibly ask for? So um, by the 60s, early 70s, I'd say, a lot of stuff starts to change. And, and you know, I can deal with this a little bit more in the question and answer period. But here is a, a late 60s cookbook by the thriller writer, Len Dayton. Uh, he wrote The Ipcress File and other uh, uh, spy novels. So it shows on the back cover or front cover, they're cooking together, right? And it's again, it's sex and food. She's ladling the pasta and he's hugging her. But on the other, uh, the roles are reversed, right? On the, I can't remember which is the front and which is the back, but it uh, doesn't really matter. He's ladling the pasta and she's kind of uh, uh, cuddling with him. So um, on that kind of happy note, I think I will uh, ask for your questions, uh, which can be recorded in the chat. Uh, and uh, JJ, I think, is going to read them out to me. And thank you for your attention. I'd be very interested in, uh, you know, either your questions or your uh, comments based on your own experience, since after all, American food is something that we all uh, know something about. Absolutely. You know, uh, I have to, perhaps I can start with one, uh, a simple question, um, or, or perhaps an observation. Uh, you know, if folks would like to um, get a copy of American Cuisine or any of your other works. Uh, do you have a preferred outlet that you'd like us uh, um, to go retrieve them from? Ha preferred outlet, your local bookstore. Outstanding. Uh, more likely outlet, Amazon. You know, I have to say, um, I would definitely encourage, uh, American Cuisine is the only one that I've read personally. And I would heartily encourage everyone to uh, to read a copy. Um, but I have to confess, Paul, that it's, it's, it's kind of an emotional roller coaster. I actually uh, have the audiobook book um, 
Mm -hmm. And so as I'm listening to it, I get, um, uh, I'm kind of uh, intrigued by the insights and fascinated by things. And then when a, a recipe is read out loud, I, I, I instantly get uh, hungry and I get frustrated because I'm usually driving as I'm listening to the audio books. And yeah. it's, it's, it's a unique experience. <laughs> that's, that's funny because my history of food class is a 1030. And it kind of makes me hungry. It ends at 1120. <laughs> but for the students, I don't think this is a problem because for them, 1030, they're just dragging themselves out of bed, many of them. So I've got a class about 115 students. The ones who are athletes will have been up probably pretty early. And a lot of the students are athletes. But the non-athletes, it's, it's like I get comments from evaluations when I taught it at this time in the past. Like, I really like the class, even though it's really kind of early. And this is hilarious to me because these are students who just a couple of years ago when they were in high school, you know, were waiting for the bus at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their you know, habits completely change. <laughs> you know, um, I have to say it's been rather. Um, uh, it's 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 interesting to note, and you know, you can correct me if uh, um, if if I'm wrong on this, but um, you know, here at the museum, as we research uh, foodways um, of the early 1800s, and uh, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, looking through primary sources. Uh, and, you know, just kind of scouring the internet and seeing what's out there. And it seems to me that there's a delightful re uh, um, celebration of historic cookery and trying to find meaning in, um, in, in something a, a little bit more substantial than just, you know, the calories that you ingest to, uh, to get through the day, right? Uh, you know, I mean, if you just go on, you know, YouTube or the various blogs out there, there's so many people doing uh, exciting things, captivating things that I don't really think were around uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Meaning. When you say uh, people find meaning in this, I think that's very important. That's why I'm interested in food history, because it's not only just curiosity about what people ate, but what, what the food means to them in terms of their own lives, uh, ranging from nostalgia to um, sense of self. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah, like uh, Andy was saying, um, we got a couple questions here. Uh, Joy uh, asks, does the variety of American food mirror the melting pot concept of America? I would think that the various immigrant groups may have brought their own foods. Uh, also, is this still true? Immigrants bringing their own foods? Uh, to answer the second part, immigrants still are bringing their own foods, yes. And uh, uh, some of are adapted, uh, like, you know, uh, um, Thai food. Some are not, like Filipino food. But, but the melting pot or the immigrant population is what I'd call a necessary but not sufficient condition. Necessary in that you, yes, these restaurants began to serve an immigrant community. But in Spain, for example, uh, or France, there have always been a lot of immigrants. So a lot of immigrants from their colonial empires. Uh, the Spanish had lots and lots of people from Latin America, but the Spanish had no curiosity about the restaurants of Mexican or Peruvian immigrants. The French had no curiosity about North African, like Tunisian food. So the first Americans to sort of wander into a Chinese restaurant, and this is again back around the 1880s or 1890s, or an Italian restaurant, uh, so-called bohemians who tended to be urban people with money and not very many uh, uh, family commitments. Uh, that is what set the United States apart. So as early as 1900, uh, you have a thing called the chop suey craze, a huge number of restaurants opening up all over the country, like that place in Butte, Montana. Uh, you have um, boasts in the newspapers about how the food in Paris may be better than in the United States, but nobody has the international variety that we do. All right, we have uh, Thomas uh, has another comment here. He asks, uh, uh, he welcomes comments on the disappearing of ethnic grocery stores with the exception of the many uh, uh, oriental slash Mexican groceries. 
Anything to say on that? Well, so disappearance of things by ethnic to be like German or Polish um, or, uh, you know, sort of depends on the ethnicity. So a lot of Eastern European stores used to be common where I grew up in New York. Uh, Jewish delicatessens were common uh, and now they're rare. They're, they're not extinct, but they're, you know, kind of endangered. Um, some of this just has to do with who is going to go into the food store business. When I graduated from college, all of the, well, when I was a kid, all of the grocers in New York City were Italian. At least that was the stereotype. But in the 1970s, they were all from Korea. But both the Italians and the Koreans became sort of uh, affluent. Uh, the, the Korean vegetable or produce market person, their kid went to medical school. And so now uh, different ethnic groups um, succeed. So like a lot of Italian restaurants and stores in New York City are now run by people, more recent immigrants from Albania. So Albania is an example of an answer to the other question about are recent immigrants remaking food? In some cases, yes, uh, you know, I went to an Albanian restaurant uh, in the Bronx uh, uh, several times last year, but they're also kind of under the radar remaking it because Italians don't want to deal with uh, the food business as much as they used to. And so Croatians and Albanians have taken that niche over. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's obviously it's different in uh, uh, where, where uh, you guys live, but that's, that's a kind of pattern or at least a, an example of this uh, shifting.